Um, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Moniz Farooqi. I'm in the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies. And today's talk is sponsored by the Berkeley Pakistan Initiative, which is a simultaneous initiative that we're running alongside the Urdu Initiative. So on that note, um, allow me to just say that tonight is actually the first time in my six and a half, uh, seven years at Berkeley where I've been asked to introduce two people in the same event. I've done one people uh, mm -hmm. uh, very often, but never two. And now this may not seem like a big deal to you, but I must confess, anything that takes me away from a kind of straight and narrow path causes anxiety. <laughs> and uh, last night, it was around three o'clock that I woke up uh, with a bit of a start, uh, wondering as to how I was going to introduce uh, the two uh, speakers for today's event. And the thoughts that went through my head were essentially, do I go by academic seniority? Do I go yes. alphabetically? Yes. Uh, yes. yes. Or do I self-consciously reverse orders so that I mix things up and not seem obvious? Uh, in any case, um, the long and short of it is that I essentially decided to have a coin toss. Oh. And uh, Professor Robert Cruz won. Oh. So, so, Sorry. So, Sorry. so you go first. Um, Professor um, Robert Cruz, who also goes by Bob Cruz, is an associate professor in the history department and the director of the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies at Stanford University. He received his PhD from Princeton and Columbia, and his MA from Columbia. In addition to two edited volumes, namely Under the Drones, the subject of tonight's talk, which he co-edited with Professor Bashir, and the Taliban and the Crisis of Afghanistan, which he co-edited with Amin Tarzi. Uh, Professor Cruz has also single authored an extremely well-received 2006 book called For Profit and Tsar, Islam and Empire in Russia and Central Asia. At present, he is hard at work on a book that is tentatively titled A Global History of Afghanistan. <laughs> yes. sure. Remarkably, all of Professor Cruz's projects have been published by Harvard University Press. If writing books is all you think Professor Cruz does, however, think again. For he's also the author of around 15 articles on everything from urbanism in Central Asia to the Taliban, to Muslim networks in Tajar, Iran, and Tsarist Russia, and to the global arms trade. Professor Cruz truly is a man with many interests, skills, and yes, remarkable amounts of energy. <laughs> Indeed, the same can be said for his Stanford colleague and sometimes collaborator, Professor Shahzad Bashir. Professor Bashir is the Lisbeth Warren Anderson Professor in Islamic Studies in the, program, in the Department of Religion. He also is the director of the Abbasi Program in Islamic Studies. <coughs> Professor Bashir received his MA and PhD at Yale University, and since doing so in 1998, has received in numerous major grants, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, an American Council of Learned Societies Fellowship, and a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship. These awards are as much a reflection, I believe, of Professor Bashir's reputation as a star in the Islamic Studies firmament, as a man whose work is marked by insightfulness and, yes, theoretical sophistication. In addition to the co-edited Under the Drones, Professor Bashir has single authored a number of books. They include Sufi Bodies, Religion and Society in Medieval Islam, which appeared in 2011, Fazrullah Astrabadi and the Rufis, which came out in 2005, and Messianic Hopes and Mystical Visions, the Nur Bakhshia between Medieval and Modern Islam in 2003. <coughs> Complementing these works are at least 13 major articles covering everything from dreaming in Persianate Sufi hagiographies to Nur Bakhshis in contemporary Pakistan, to celibacy in the Islamic tradition, to messianism in medieval Shiism, to, and this is my favorite, cannibalism in early Safavid Iran. <laughs> like Professor Cruz, Professor Bashir has set a very high bar for folks like me who follow in his wake. On that note, and without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professors Cruz and Bashir, or Professors Bashir and Cruz. <laughs> Thank you. That's the, probably the kindest, most generous invitation um, and introduction I've, I've received. Thank you. And I'm also touched to be next to the star in the firmament next to me. I thought he was just a good driver. He drove me from 
from the Bay, but he's also a star in Fairman. <laughs> so I trust, that will, I trust that will lead us safely home tonight. So, uh, but thank you, uh, Professor Faruqi. Thank you, Ben Az Rofi. Thank you, Prini Takala, for organizing all this. And um, if I may speak for Shazad, which I will, I should offer a disclaimer first. Nothing I, I do or say will is meant to reflect negatively on him. Although I will, even though I want to use his own words against him, I'll, I'll do that. Um, but no, we're both very grateful to be here, and it's wonderful to be on the campus. And um, we were thrilled to see the first Berkeley students as we drove up to <laughs> college, because um, you know we teach at Stanford, so we don't get to have this. So I hope some of you are at least getting extra credit. Anyone getting extra credit for attending? No? See? Ah, see? True intellectual curiosity flourishing <laughs> at Berkeley. Which I could say the same, where we teach, but you know. We could pay a little bit. He has paid more than me, but you know, it's a little. But no, thank you. It's uh, very generous of you to have us. And, and um, I'm going to say, it's odd for me at least, because Shazad and I did this book project together with a number of other authors who are not here. So I hope you will bear with us as we try to ventriloquize uh, for them, and I hope we, we do them justice, or at least I can do them justice in representing some of their views. Um, so I thought I'd start by saying a few words about how the project began, um, and um, describe a bit of its evolution, and to highlight some of the main themes of the book, in case you've not had to endure it yet yourselves, and then suggest um, some possible ways that some of the, the concepts in the book might help us think through um, the, the present and perhaps future of, of Afghanistan and, and Pakistan. So it'll be very schematic. Sorry, I feel like I'm still on the road um, with our fun two-hour trip up from the Bay Area. So bear with me, please. And this is all meant to make Shazad look much better, because he'll be eloquent and, and concise and, and wonderful, as always. Forgive me if I'm a bit scattered. Um, so again, it's wonderful to have people interested in, in a war, a place that is largely absent from American politics, it seems, in the presidential season. Many of you know that Romney caught out a flag for not bringing up the war during his Republican address um, at his coronation. Um, but it's also not been a major feature of the Obama administration. And perhaps we'll return to that theme. So you're among the few hardy Americans, it seems, who uh, appear to still be paying attention to Afghanistan and Pakistan and to America's longest war. Just to give you a, a brief statistic you may already know, um, Obama's surge in his so-called good war is now finished. The 33,000 troops sent there uh, already in small numbers um, when he came into the, the office, are now gone. That leaves still some 66,000 American troops there in Afghanistan uh, waiting to return since late 2014, although there's been noise now about bringing them home sooner. sooner. And as you also know, um, and as our colleagues in the Stanford Law School and at NYU remind us, um, drone attacks continue in, in Pakistan. So um, all this is very much a kind of live issue but I think what Shazad and I came to in, in trying to think about this was um, trying to seek an alternative to what has been the predominant discourse about Afghanistan and Pakistan. And much of this, of course, has an older history. Some of the themes that you'll see in the book actually engage with ideas that date from the British Empire, of course, this crowd as well. But many of these ideas actually are specific to a particular kind of intellectual moment of the late Bush and early Obama periods. So the whole formulation of AFPAC which we don't see used that frequently now, was born uh, you know, early on uh, in the Obama administration, took on institutional form under um, a special envoy, Richard Holbrook. Um, one of the, our title is taken from, of course, the phenomenon of the drones. Um, it's a metaphor, not all of our reviewers appreciate that because they want more about the, the actual mechanics of drones and so on. Um, but the symbolism of the drone, I guess our sense of frustration sitting in, in the, you know, the Ivy Tower of, of Stanford, um, our frustration with um, the predominant discourse about the conflict. So um, the mystification of, of Afghans, of Pakistanis, and indeed increasingly, I think from at least 2008, the vilification of these populations in the American media and in American political discourse. Much of this, as we'll see, targeted Pashtuns in particular, both on the Afghan and, and Pakistani sides. Um, but both of us as historians of a sort were concerned that um, most people talking about Afghanistan and Pakistan and talking about the war were engaged in some kind of project of, of mystification and, in the end, uh, villainization increasingly of, of these populations. So we struggled to try to arrive at a kind of framework that would be not a guide to how to, to hone the, the war machine, uh, which I think is a fair characterization of most of the literature on uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan since um, the 80s and 90s and certainly since uh, 2001. 
Again, much of this literature we'll see um, actually is really written in a voice that I think attempts to channel the power of Washington, that attempts to speak to Washington, that attempts to make, um, to make the, the Americans fight a better war, leaving aside mostly um, the local actors that are really, we've tried to put at the center of our book. So in short, we've tried to come up with an alternative to the overarching security lens through which uh, so much is filtered in American political and public discourse. The AFPAC formulation was really the most striking example of this because, as you may recall, if you go back to look at the actual, the first uses of that term, uh, Richard Holbrook used it in connection with what he called a kind of um, a continuous space of, of war, right? So imagining Afghanistan and Pakistan together in this new entity as a single war theater. So that idea struck us as something that was worth interrogating. Um, it was also a moment uh, when we were beginning to, to work on this, when the, the Pentagon's human terrain system was going full bore. It was getting a lot of attention because here we had the application of social scientific knowledge on a scale not seen since Vietnam applied to phenomena, uh, very exotic phenomena like tribes, right? The Pashtun, the mystical um, and mysterious Pashtun tribes. And of course, those categories also e uh, easily map onto things like Islam. Um, and the Pashtuns seem to kind of unify this for both, again, the, the Afghan and, and Pakistani stories. So if one looks at the human terrain system of the Pentagon, we see a lot of old British colonial categories dressed up as modern social science. In fact, many of the sources, if you follow the footnotes, come from 19th century British uh, colonial officers. But the paradox under Obama, of course, was that these were imperial categories, but without an empire. Right? It'd be hard to find you in the, in the White House who would identify the United States as an empire. And yet we have on the ground more and more generals with their own social science degrees. We have a number of them, they often take residence at Stanford, it's striking that many of the generals who have um, who've led the war since 2001, but especially since 2004 and 2009, hold uh, either masters or PhDs in various social science disciplines. And some of them, in fact, have studied at, at, um, at Stanford. Uh, we have a, a, a guy in residence now who I think did, a, did a, an MA, but uh, David Petraeus is perhaps the most famous example of the kind of uh, soldier scholar right, who rose to prominence in the Iraq War, but then turned that same logic under Obama of the surge uh, and of certain kinds of uh, yeah, the pursuit of knowledge about things like tribe, uh, mapping that onto Afghanistan as Obama's exit strategy. So it's a peculiar moment. We have these scholar intellectuals applying social sciences, but doing it in a way that, that struck Shazad and me, having studied this region uh, for various degrees of time, um, as wholly out of touch with the real politics of the place, with the real interests of the people who actually inhabit this space. So even to this day, we get tropes about the region and about this very interesting frontier that they share, uh, which claim that the place is kind of timeless, right? It's people live beyond time, right? We have, that, we have you know, wild uh, as a kind of qualifier constantly being kind of used for this. Um, we hear uh, this repeated fascination with the, the Duran line, that is the, the Afghan-Pakistan border. Uh, we hear often that it's, you know, it's unreal, uh, it has no meaning for the people on the ground, and yet that is not really um, followed much more closely. Um, we have counterinsurgency doctrines, which are very interesting if you look at them closely because um, they claim to be based on anthropology. And yet, if you, again, if you look at the footnotes, there's not a single anthropologist, I'm sure not on this campus or on mine, that would recognize any of those theories, any of those models, as being appropriate. Uh, in fact, they've been intellectually rejected from at least the 1960s. So it's very interesting that we've had this kind of militarized social science and anthropology being used in a way that, that very few of their academic practitioners would recognize, at least surely on the, on the anthropological side. Um, at the same time, we have um, a new counterinsurgency campaign, again, with lots of ideas being brought from Iraq uh, under Obama and, and Petraeus. We have, as you all know very well, an intensification and, and expansion of the, the drone program. And we can show numbers with you, but of course, those are, are now common knowledge and, and their effects on the ground. We received lots of press recently. And yet one of the paradoxes that, um, that Shazad helped me see um, in the epilogue of the book pointed to a quite peculiar moment of 2011 when uh, two important figures from this region entered public attention in, in fascinating ways. The first being uh, Greg Mortensen, the author of uh, Three Cups of Tea and I think Stones into Schools. I guess a, a temporary resident of Berkeley at some point back in the day, or at least of its streets. Right? <laughs> I think his bus may have, or his van may have passed through here, <laughs> but who's didn't, right? 
Didn't say they didn't do that. Um, Greg Mortensen's uh, scheme, uh, I guess he and I might call it, was revealed as a fraud. I think in the spring of 2011, um, he's exposed first by uh, a, a, an investigative journalist and later by uh, 60 Minutes. Um, this is a figure who, who you may know, his, his books are still bestsellers. They're still selling thousands more copies probably every second than Shazad and I will ever sell. <laughs> so it tells you what I know. Forgive me for coming tonight. Um, but the whole story, of course, is it's kind of heart and mind story. And if you know anything about his background, you know, he uh, was uh, supposedly once a mountaineer, stumbled into a village, learned that local people needed schools, then raised millions of dollars in the United States to, to build schools, primarily in Pakistan, but they got, got morphed into Afghanistan because it's all the same anyway, right? Who cares about differences, borders, passports? I don't. Why should people with lots of money? Um, that all got morphed together in after 2001, of course, and as the hearts and minds platform um, was adopted by the counterinsurgency people, um, he got to go to dinner with Petraeus and people like that, right? So they began buying his books. Some of the general's wives in their book clubs read this text and said, you know, this is what we need. This is how the United States is going to win the war, right? Building schools, winning over hearts and minds. So that scandal blew up um, not long before another issue figure um, from the region also emerged again in a new way on our television sets. Um, with the assassination of Osama bin Laden of May of 2011. And here I'm going to ventriloquize my colleague here, who's much smarter, the firmament here, the star in the firmament. It suggests that Mortensen and, and, and bin Laden are actually worth talking about together. He says it more eloquently in the book, but this sounds shocking to us. One's a mass murderer, one's a humanitarian. But in fact, in the conception of the region, they share much that's in common. Both come from outside. Both um, basically have tried to kind of make make of these peoples and politics uh, what they will for causes far, far away. And both have, have formed the, the nexus of a kind of securitization of the American view of this territory. So as different as they are, they're worth talking about together because uh, for many people, uh, these are the two kind of windows onto the region. Osama bin Laden on one hand, Greg Mortensen on the other, uh, with the kind of the security nexus tying them together. Um, and, and both in, um, bringing security together, but also pushing aside um, any concern for what actually is happening on the ground, what local communities are concerned about, you know, about the textures of these local societies. And both arguably play on this idea that, that Afghanistan and Pakistan are kind of empty places. The borderland in particular is this kind of wild place. It's empty, it's timeless, um, it's remote, it's violent, all these things that, that are somehow part of what drove these two uh, disparate, but in the end, I think, uh, Analogous agendas. So our book attempted to to, to take on um, this way of thinking about um, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Again, some of it is, is situated around this moment of, of the early Obama administration, which has remained constant. We can return to that theme later. But a lot of it, uh, of course, engages with American ideas about the region since 2001, and of course, all these ideas uh, have a deeper history. Nothing, of course, starts fresh after 9/11. So. What are some of the broader conclusions of the book? What did we hope to show? And again, I'm going to simplify and kind of make some, some closet pictures and then soon turn the floor over to a more refined view with Shazad. But in short, I guess to, to summarize briefly, uh, one of the, the chief aims of, of the, the book is to demystify a lot of what we have confronted uh, through popular culture, through what our politicians have told us um, about the region. And in fact, as historians um, who are open to social science techniques, um, and as many of our contributors uh, come from different fields, and some are actually journalists, you know, some come out of anthropology, some come out of history, some come out of um, economics, uh, actually, um, who are very you know, hardcore into numbers. All this is, I think, uh, confirmed for us the view that we can actually apply so-called normal categories to this space. Right? We don't need to resort to the kind of uh, fog of, of the deep past. This idea that, for example, Afghanistan is this graveyard of empires, these kinds of ahistorical cliches. Um, we can actually talk about the politics being modern. In fact, many of the pieces in our book attempt to show that the politics of Afghanistan and Pakistan the frontier are, are thoroughly modern, that they are actually the product of the interaction of local communities with um, national politics, much like national politics around the world and other societies. That local communities have long engaged with uh, various kinds of transnational networks, long before anyone had ever heard of or thought of Al-Qaeda, that they've engaged with empires, they've engaged with nation states, and they've engaged with lots of kinds of transnational networks. 
uh, that they're not passive victims. In fact, one of our objections to this recent um, Stanford Law School NYU report, which got a lot of press this last, past week, was that um, though it's great to draw attention to the drone war, in the end, it reverts to some of these other tropes in, in basically treating the populations of this territory as kind of passive victims, right? Not as the agents of their own lives, but as victims of, of agents that come from far away and that transform their lives. Um, much of what we try to do is, and what our authors try to do, is actually show how local actors engage with these broader power structures. Um, uh, but in the end, you know, it's a much complicated, much more complicated story. So the politics of the frontier and the politics of both states are modern. They're very much about uh, nationalist politics, right? We often see all this through a, a, a kind of ethnic or tribal lens, as if those things are, are backward, different from our own, totally alien, in a kind of, in a kind of old school, outdated anthropological mode. Um, we imagine this kind of wholly other posthumous society, for example. Um, increasingly has taken on a moral character, uh, with, uh, as you may know from 2008, 2009, if one searches through representations of, of postures in particular, we see um, more and more references to things like pedophilia, to all kinds of sexual mischief, and a general sense of, you know, kind of uh, rabid violence and uh, immorality. Um, this stuff is not necessarily present in an earlier moment in the same way. And much of it, I think, is, is uh, in direct relation to the fate of the American War Project. So again, as the American War Project struggled, we get these new images, uh, and interestingly, much of them focus around the sexuality of these populations who are causing so much trouble uh, for Washington and for NATO, of course. So nationalism appears more and more at the center of the analysis of many of the pieces of this book, uh, rather than religion as this kind of pre-existing category. And I know Shazab will have much more to say about this. So in short, we can, uh, we can talk about class, we can talk about the construction of nationhood. We can talk about all these things in this region. Right? We don't have to resort to special de-exoticized categories to understand politics in Afghanistan or, um, or, or Pakistan. To take one concrete example, this very messy Duran line, this border, which has been much discussed in a very, I think, ahistorical way, in a non-comparative way, which makes this border look completely uh, sui generis. And um, through the security lens, as one of the key problems of uh, Afghan and Pakistani politics. That is, it's noted that everyone knows, of course, this border is very porous. There are essentially <laughs> ethnic communities on both sides, right? There's lots of traffic, lots of movement back and forth, there's smuggling, movement in arms and drugs and people. All these things that, through a state lens, look like negative phenomena, of course, to be policed and to be subject to some kind of security control. Um, what some of our authors do, in fact, is, is see the border in new ways, right? We have a, a wonderful French scholar, Gilles Doronsoro, who comes out of a kind of uh, political anthropology tradition uh, of Paris, um, who actually sees, in fact, a very pragmatic uses of the border on the part of uh, clerics who inhabit this space, on the part especially of merchants, for whom, by the way, the border is quite significant because the border and its controls, lax though they may be, are important enough that goods are valued differently so that we have a rationale for smuggling. At the same time, he's noted in his fieldwork in Pakistan uh, the growth of, of Urdu in, in, along the frontier region. So here he sees it simultaneously not just as a transnational space, but a space of nationalization. Indeed, it's true too on the Afghan side, where both, state, both states are, are explaining their national projects very much in reference to that border. And as Amin Tarzi shows in the very first chapter of the book, this border has been central going back, of course, to um, 1947, if not before, in how Afghan and Pakistani elites have imagined uh, not only their nations and their states, but their relations with one another, uh, with uh, the frequent use of this border as an attempt to, um, as a strategy really, a kind of political project to undermine and delegitimize their neighbor. And I mean, Tarzi, who comes from uh, an Afghan family, I think makes a very important point to actually shift some of the onus from, um, from Pakistan. We read in our media, of course, that it's always Pakistan that is undermining Afghanistan. Um, there's a kind of Kabul-centric view of Pakistani politics. But I mean, very rightly points out that no Afghan state um, has ever recognized that border. The Taliban didn't do it, even though many would see them as the sujas of Pakistan. But it's a very interesting way of pointing to, uh, uh, he would say, I think, the, the irresponsible conduct of, of the Karzai government in, in not answering one of the security, um, or perceived security needs of, of Islamabad. So it's something, it's a perspective that one will not find in our media, of course. Um, and it's an interesting way to step back from a kind of moralizing 
approach to all this to actually look more or less objectively on it, it, both sides of this dynamic and, and not seeing it simply as a case of you know, good guys and bad guys, people in white hats, people in, in black hats. So we know this is a very mobile space. Um, we have some of our contributors who pay attention to the space, not just as one of, of smuggling and violence, but one where we have very um, cosmopolitan literary creation. So we have a, a piece that I think Shazal will talk about, which really focuses in a way that is quite unique on the aesthetics, language, and politics of Pashto communities that cross the border. So this ranges from poetry with a very kind of old history to very recent um, uh, internet mass media stuff. So we have uh, ways of being Pashtun, ways of using Pashto constantly reinvented. Um, so there that leads us to a kind of cluster of questions about ethnicity. As you know, for reading the New York Times or anything about, especially Afghanistan, actually less I think in the case of Pakistan, um, and again, related to this securitization lens, um, ethnicity is thought to be the key to understanding Afghan politics, right? If you scratch beyond that, of course, it's tribe, right? And I, I don't know about you, but I've taught um, a number of very smart uh, officers who've been visiting at Stanford at various times, and uh, they definitely want to know the, the ins and outs of, of mapping of tribes, seeing that as a, this knowledge is a kind of uh, lever of political control. What we have here in the case of this one, uh, German scholar, Luz Shehak, who's done extend, uh, extensive field work in South um, Western Pakistan among the Baluch. Uh, we have also lessons that are applicable to the larger Pashtun community. And that is um, by looking closely at language and its, its historicity, looking at the different categories of, of um, description that the Baluch themselves use about what ethnicity means, about what Baluch identity is. We have really, in the end, though he's very modest about it in this essay, a kind of a total destruction of the idea of uh, a primordialist, um, essentialist definition of ethnicity in the Afghanistan context. You may know there's a, a famous book and a very good book by Thomas Barfield that has become you know, kind of the book on on Afghanistan. And um, I've used it in class, and it's probably it's probably you know, the standard textbook now. And yet it rests on this very integrated primordialist view of ethnicity. We have uh, ethnic blocks moving. Uh, more or less en masse in this kind of cohesive way so that all we need really is to know someone's ethnicity or the, the label and to understand the politics. So if we look closely actually at a particular case study in the way that Luz Jihak does, all of this falls apart. So it's a wonderful critique um, that, that again uh, asserts the priority of, of, of the national, of nationalist politics in, um, in Afghanistan. Um, we get a similar conclusion from a German scholar who writes about the Taliban and whether or not this is a tribal movement. He asks how tribal are the Taliban. Here too we see the centrality of, of the nation, of the Afghan nation, um, that is, it forms all these narratives and self-descriptions about what it means to be Pashtun, to be Baluch, to be, to be a Talib, to be Taliban, to be an Afghan. Um, all this I think is, is new and, and, and far removed um, from what we are usually subjected to in our mass media and other kinds of expert opinions. Um, I'll pause for a moment just to, to step, maybe create a transition for, for Shazad. Um, there's also a great deal breaking down what we mean by Islam, the problem of, of activism, of radicalism. Uh, Faisal Devshi has a wonderful piece on um, the Red Mosque incident of 2007. Perhaps Shazad will say something more about that. Um, but basically suggesting, again, by a close analysis of what people actually say, right, rather than what we attribute to them, um, to try to interpret how Pakistani activists have reconceived of Islam in this very complicated context. But then I promised, um, and we can, in the question and answer course, ex um, expand on this. Um, in the book, we had to exclude certain topics. And now I think in retrospect, if I can speak for myself, um, probably, you know, we're, we're very, very fortunate to find experts from around the world to contribute to this. But one whole, which I think has grown bigger with time and as the United States begins to Depart has been a, a greater theme in American public discourse about the war and about, you know, AFPAC, um, is the problem of corruption. And here I think this, the alternative lens that we've suggested um, is worth thinking about further. And I'll just cite a, a handful of, of examples, um, which I think links some of these themes, which, you know, of course will lead to the next scholar to sort out um, challenging as it is. So let me just uh, begin to conclude by citing a, um, a recent analysis of the U.S. budget in Afghanistan alone, excluding Pakistan. Um, 
So by 2013, the United States uh, is planning to spend, um, or will have spent $641 billion in Afghanistan. Um, about 30% of this total amount for the entire war, that's from 2001 to the present. So 30% of that, which is 190 billion, um, is earmarked for 2012-2013 alone. So the United States, as part of its exit strategy, is injecting 198 billion, or is projected to inject 198 billion dollars into Afghanistan in the next what 18 months. So as the author of this report, the Center for Strategic and National Studies noted, this is an incredible amount of money to have spent with so few controls, so few plans, so little auditing, and almost no credible measures of effectiveness. And yet when we look at our representations of development in Afghanistan, of the so-called transition, what we see again and again is this discourse of corruption. That is the Afghans that are to blame uh, for misusing this money. That is the Karzai family that is enriching itself. That is the, you know, these nefarious local officials who are stealing money. Now some of that may be true, this isn't meant to exculpate the Karzai's or the governors or, or really anyone on the ground, but if one begins to shift the lens, right, um, away from this moralizing discourse and ask, you know, what is meant to happen with this $190 billion? Um, I think we begin to arrive at different questions about what corruption means. Right? What does it mean to be injecting $190 billion into a country like Afghanistan in an 18-month period? Those are decisions being made in Washington by uh, American officials. And yet, um, the moral discourse is all about the failures of, of the Afghans. And it still it remains to be seen how that money will be spent, how it will be delivered, uh, what the consequences um, will be. A second theme, um, which I think is seen through this kind of distorted lens uh, beyond the budget and the cash, is the problem of um, detention in Afghanistan. You may have followed, there's a dispute, ongoing dispute uh, between the Karzai administration and the US military about the handling of, um, of insurgents or supposed insurgents detained on the battlefield. So again, on the one hand, we have the US Pentagon uh, uh, and other, of course, human rights groups criticizing the Afghan record of human rights, and yet uh, Americans are refusing to hand over Afghans who've been held on Afghan soil now for, in some cases, over a decade. So you have, on one hand, this critique of lawlessness and the affirmation of the uh, rule of law state. At the same time, the United States is engaging practices that, by all accounts, by, by neutral um, actors, of course, is, is seen as a violation of basic human rights and a, a, a major blow to the rule of law which is all the talk in, of course, international development work. Stanford has a major center to, to the Center for Democracy, Development, and Rule of Law. Um, this is all at the centerpiece of what the American project is supposed to be about in, in Afghanistan. And yet, there's very little critique of this idea that the United States can hold people uh, without any, um, any due process for a decade or more on end. So the United States is still insisting on its, its, uh, its capacity to, to carry on such practices and yet, we have that juxtaposed with critiques of the immorality of these Afghan officials and their inability to uphold the rule of law. So it's that, that juxtaposition, that tension, that I think merits more attention um, and, and definitely would inform a different understanding of what we mean when we say you know, corruption. What do we actually, is this a kind of moral claim? Is this something that we hear more of because of our sense of, uh, I mean, is this the kind of last, the last assertion of American moral superiority in this conflict? Is it gonna come down to blaming the Afghans for all the failures of, of this American project. That leads me to a, a, a last question, which I think would be interesting to talk about, to hear your thoughts later, and that's the question of actually how this war will end. Um, many generals, on down to you know, the privates on the front lines, have talked about um, basically the futility of combat as a means to end this, this conflict. So we hear multiple incantations of the need for the reintegration of, of fighters, and in the end, some kind of amorphous reconciliation. Uh, we also have you know, lofty descriptions of, of talks, negotiations, uh, a vague notion that somehow a political settlement is the only way to end the war, that fighting won't, won't do it. And this really all uh, often uh, put under the rubric of reconciliation. And yet, since Richard Holbrook died, you'll recall, um, the United States has done uh, nothing um, to pursue peace talks, uh, negotiation, reconciliation with the Taliban. And it's one of the questions I think is, is worth, worth asking. Uh, there's a recent book by Rajiv um, Chandrasekharan, Little America, which has got lots of press. It's a very good book. It tells you much about the experience of soldiers in Helmand, where he was embedded. Uh, but it also flashes back and forth to Washington to, to get a, a kind of 
here on the ground feel for how Washington politicians and the Obama cabinet are talking about this. But what stands out, and this is partly amplified by my conversation with a, a former insider who's now at Stanford, I won't name him, but um, the class of American diplomacy uh, in Afghanistan is one of the, the striking features, the kind, of, the kind of cousin to the militarization of anthropology, to the human training system, to American counterinsurgency counter strategy. American counterinsurgency strategy has not really imagined um, talking to people. Some of the language is there, but what they essentially mean is surrender. Um, if you look actually at the language um, and the categories that are employed and people who talk about this stuff, basically they want the, po the, the populations involved to be depoliticized um, and, and generally loyal. So it, it's a, they've talked about it as a way to basically shift politics out of the equation. So that people are asked to, to lay down their arms, recognize the Afghan uh, constitution as a kind of precondition uh, and there are others for talks. But as we enter election season, and, and following Holbrook's death, what is striking is that no one in the Obama administration, including Obama, has followed up on what experts around the, the world have said now for at least three, four, five years, that some kind of political process is the only way to end this conflict. Um, and unfortunately, again, I was turning to the broader theme of how to think about corruption, um, it's, it's tempting to look at the history of the Secretary of State, right, the Chief Diplomat. It's tempting to look at the, the size of the diplomatic corps. I think, I think Stanford has more staff members than all of USAID. Mm -hmm. And yet books like Chandra Sarkhan's blame, you know, blame the civilians for mucking up development in Afghanistan. Yet, of course, you have a Pentagon with more than a million people. There are more marching bands, apparently, under the Pentagon than there are uh, diplomats in the US Foreign Service. Um, and, and of course, we have a, a Secretary of State eager, no doubt, to become the next president of the United States. So it's a, a very indirect way of saying, um, for political reasons, for domestic political reasons, neither Obama uh, nor Clinton appear uh, for their own, I think, arguably, if you want to use this regional rhetoric, their own dynastic family concerns, um, they refuse to engage in a political process to end the war. Um, again, to me as an outsider looking from California to Washington, this looks very much like um, you know, a decision rooted in domestic politics, but which put in this broader context is a kind of family politics, right? It's a family, of, it's a politics of privilege. Um, it's what many people would call a kind of corruption, right? If we were to use that, use those categories in a more general, a kind of universal sense. Again, I don't like the category anyway, it tends to be moralizing, but uh, to be fair, I think we should put this all in the same mix, as my colleague did with Bin Laden and, and Greg Mortensen. So on that dark note, um, let me turn turn the stage over to the star here. And I look forward to um, your questions, comments, and thoughts uh, very soon. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to Muniz, Bonita, and Benaz um, for your wonderful hosting of this event. As, as Bob was saying, for those of us who teach at Stanford, when we uh, drive into Berkeley, we wish we had been as lucky as um, Muniz and gotten down here instead. But <laughs> um, hopefully not Stanford people. Okay, so. <laughs> Um, so it's a pleasure to be here, and far from being a star in the firmament, I think Bob has actually done this, the essential job of laying out what the, the project of the volume is and what is in it. Um, so, and, and admirably so, I completely and totally sign on to the same, uh, what he has said, in terms of what our perspective was in putting together the volume and um, what is in it. So what I'm actually going to do is to uh, treat him as the star in the firmament and be a small satellite around the star um, and circle around certain themes, uh, largely uh, uh, kind of emphasizing some of the things that have already been mentioned and then bringing out some of the some details that are in some of the articles in the book. Um, I think the, initially uh, when Bob and I first decided to hold the, the <coughs> workshop at Stanford which eventually led to the book, the, the, it really began from a kind of intense frustration with respect to how things are covered. Um, uh, personally, my, most of my own work has to do with the late medieval and early modern period. And the, what in, when I'm working on that material, the place that has now become Afghanistan is absolutely central. Cities like Herat and Kabul are not backward places by any means. Actually, quite frankly, um, in the, at the end of the 15th century, on which I have worked quite a bit, 
Herat would have to be counted as one of the most glorious cities in the world in terms of its wealth, in terms of its culture, etc. Right. So the idea that somehow this space has no history and therefore, and in any, the only Bible re historical references we have are uh, Alexander the Great and then the British is a completely, I mean, it's just a, a absolutely maddening in terms of someone who actually knows anything about uh, the, the larger history of that space. So this was one of the, the major uh, things for at least for me uh, in terms of bringing uh, a, a different perspective to bear on on this space. Now, but the idea was not, um, as, as you can see in the book, it was not somehow to treat um, the place again as somehow a repository of antiquarian interests. So we can talk about Herat in the 16th century, but today somehow there is a kind of a lap. The time, time somehow stopped between the 16th century and now. Um, what we wanted to do very much was, as Bob said, to demystify the space as it is today and treat the human beings who live in that space as complex human beings with long histories, with long traditions of uh, not just of literature, of politics, of religion, of um, uh, formation and reformation that has happened many, many different times. Right. Um, so it's it's really demystification in the quite literal sense of simply arguing that the people who live in this space are like any other human beings and the, the, the categories, the historically informed categories that we utilize to talk about other societies, including the society, societies in which we live, are applicable, applicable here as much. There's nothing bizarre or weird about the people who live there. But what is, happens there uh, has to do with the options that are avail made available to people and in the context of larger cultural, historical, social patterns that have come and gone. So it is a place of intense change, like all other places. Right? So, so that was the, the, the basic idea. And so how, then one, how does one go about do that and, uh, doing that? So our thought, um, as you can see in the volume eventually, is that we wanted people who had detailed knowledge of certain aspects of the deep social, historical, um, uh, kind of placement of, of the people who have lived in this place to come and talk about their specific topics. However, what we asked them to do in the original um, uh, conference as well as in the, in the articles very much <coughs> was to uh, present this knowledge, present this understanding, and present the depth of understanding that they have in language that would be available to the public at large. So not write in a way that is a uh, addressing a self-enclosed um, ad academic community, but is a, uh, is a in, in a larger perspective. And to the degree that what we hope very much that the volume can do um, is to, to open open this up. It, it the, We actually, I think, very much uh, thought of the volume not as, as a definitive um, perspective on the space, but to actually completely <coughs> release the space from any sense of confinement in which it can be understood or described in static terms to making it historically available. Now, what um, I want to do, we would very, very much like to um, hear your comments and concerns. Um, so I'm going to be very brief in terms of picking out certain things from the volume, to just to indicate what, what then comes out if one does take that perspective. So one of the things, of course, that is majorly in the news and has been in the news and which supposedly unites AFPAC is the question of religion and, of course, specifically Islam. All the discussion in the media uh, is uh, treats Islam as somehow something that sits outside of human beings and acts upon them. Um, I was just today reading the most recent piece by uh, the journalist Ahmed Rashid on Pakistan, uh, for example, and particularly the, the current um, uh, hoopla over the cartoon um, of the film of, over Muhammad and everything like this. If you look at his narrative, there is a what he's saying is well that the government of Pakistan <coughs> has made bad um, bad deals with the militants, which has led to this position where basically the state is devolving towards a kind of endless concession to the militants. Now, <coughs> the, the, if if one leaves the situation, if one leaves the analysis at that level, um, it actually tells us nothing whatsoever. Who exactly are the militants? Um, if, if the human beings who are being described as militants are going to be uh, understood and described solely from the perspective of what's 
some small minority of them might do on a street in a certain day. Basically, we have left their human capacity and hu their, their true humanness aside at all as, as basically being irrelevant to the analysis that is going to happen. Similarly, on the government side, the idea that the government of Pakistan uh, just interacts or can make deals with militants, etc., completely obfuscates the complexity of the Pakistani state or any state as such, with its involvement with all kinds of different populations. The state, if it is understood in this kind of utterly reified form, um, is again a meaningless analytical category. The state um, is, is, is not something that, that, again, exists outside of human beings. Now, if we, bring, uh, if we bring the focus back onto the human beings who form the state and have changed the state in all kinds of ways, as well as the so-called militants, um, we get a completely and totally different picture um, of what religion is, what religious politics is, etc. So I'll give you some examples um, uh, that are concerned particularly with the question of religion that are in the book. So for example, um, uh, Sana Harun has an article on, on the very interesting way in which the Duran line actually has acted as a major way for religious scholars in both, uh, in first in British India, and then in, uh, after the creation of Pakistan in 1947, um, as um, a place beyond which to look for employment, right? Um, so what she shows is that in the early 20th century, um, particularly those scholars who belonged to strands that were anti-colonialist, sought employment in Afghanistan, actually had a tremendous role to play in the setting up of court networks um, and the kind of quote-unquote modernization of the Afghan state in the early 20th century. When they were employed in Afghanistan, their status within British India depended on and was actually enhanced by having gone to Afghanistan. So their, their self-imposed exile or their seeking the employment outside actually valorized their presence. And she, what she suggests is then, then that the boundary actually, porous as it is, and uh, line on the map as it is, is actually a tremendously significant um, structure for the construction of religion, religious authority in 20th century South Asia. As she shows in, in a very interesting comparison when we come to the 1980s, so religious scholars in Pakistan use the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan to, in, uh, as a tool, as, as a major point through which to invigorate a religious politics in Pakistan itself. Now it's happening in reverse, right? Um, again, the boundary and what happens there and what activism, activism is to be done there actually had a tremendous impact on the politics of Pakistan. Um, and again, there is tremendous amount of detail available <coughs> on this, obviously, um, uh, in, in detailed research. Now, what this comparison tells us between those two factors is, again, the dynamism, the, com the total change, and the fact of, of, of perspectives, and the fact that religion actually comes to be constructed and can change radically based upon things like ideology, certainly, but also employment opportunities, nationalism, um, the personal interests of certain scholars, a person, uh, rivalries between different groups, etc., etc., etc. I'm not going to lay out all the details, and you can read the article, but this is just to point out that if one, if we take these individuals and groups that are involved in, in, uh, in, in, the, in the phenomenon that we're trying to, uh, to understand seriously as complicated individuals with all kinds of different allegiances, ranging from economic to ideological, what we get then is a much richer picture and a, perhaps a, a, a deeper and better understanding of what has happened in this space. Um, a second case, um, a similar one, uh, which is the, an article that Bob already mentioned by Faisal Devji on the Red Mosque. And, and Ahmed, Ahmed Rashid's article in the, on BBC again mentions the Red Mosque affair as the big turning point when the Pakistani state apparently just went, um, based, sold out to the militants. Right? But then again, what Faisal does is he actually looks at what the people who were in Red, the Red Mosque were actually saying. When we look at that, they come across, across looking like um, basically civil society activists. Well, what they want is more jobs, uh, more uh, social freedoms, uh, so, and so and so forth. All of this is done through an Islamic language. But that Islamic language is shared between them and the state. Right? The state is not something separate 
standing outside of it. The, the fact that actually they do, do use the language of Islam is precisely because that is the common currency between, uh, in the public space in Pakistan. Through that process, is, Islam comes into being and is negotiated um, in, in a social setting. One of the major things that, that Faisal points out after his brief discussion of uh, the Red Mosque is that if we actually start looking at who these militants are, uh, whether in Pakistan or in Afghanistan, as he has done in his other work, the whole notion that this is a single group completely and totally breaks down. Militancy, so-called, is utterly and completely fractured and competitive. Um, and it is aligned with, at certain times, and completely differentiated <coughs> from all manners of other types of Islam that are happening within this space. Right? Again, that provides us a, a much, um, much more uh, normalized picture of how complex societies work, um, both ideologically, socially, culturally, but also in terms of economic stress, uh, in terms of uh, population growth, in terms of all kinds of other factors that matter for all modern societies. And lastly, I'll, I'll briefly say that another article on by uh, Farzana Sheikh on um, uh, the idea that has been floated around in American think tanks like Rand Corporation that Sufi Islam is going to save Pakistan. There too, uh, this is based upon an utterly naive <coughs> understanding of what quote unquote Sufism is and what it is, what its relationship to the ideology and the reality of Pakistan is. And so what Farlana does is, again, takes this apart. It goes back to debates in the late 19th century, early 20th century in British India um, of the severe critique of Sufism as a bad type of religion. And she locates much of the ideology of Pakistan as being based in that critique of the Sufism type of religion. Now, uh, so, uh, so first of all, there's that complication. But that is to be contrasted with the fact that at the time when we were uh, finishing this book, both the president and the foreign minister of Pakistan were actually sitting holders of, uh, they were sajjad and nasheen They were the caretakers of two of the greatest, biggest, massive, wealthiest shrines in Pakistan. So here is a state whose ideology is opposed to Sufism, whose caretakers and whose power holders are exactly their power base is precisely that type of Sufism that was contrary to the ideology of the state. Um, and they're all existing together. And they react very favorably to Rand Corporation's idea that we should do something Sufi here. So actually, in the last days of the Musharraf regime, they actually started a, a ministry of Sufism, like a ministry of magic in terms of in, in, in Harry Potter. Right, I mean, so the thing is, we can say that what Musharraf and uh, those folks were doing was entirely cynical. But the interesting part is that they do respond to what happens in the Rand Corporation. And this was our other point uh, in terms of thinking about it, is that we are not arguing, by, by suggesting that we have to understand the local, we are not saying that the international or the national does not matter. But those are all act in conjunction. If we don't pay attention to the local um, and only talk in overarching international terms, we actually simply uh, cannot understand or progress in any direction with respect to finding solutions. <coughs> I think the, the language of finding solutions is that itself is highly problematic. What perhaps needs to be talked about, and Bob mentioned this already, is processes, political processes, in which different groups and individuals can feel that they have a stake. Um, and, and these things have to be negotiated and continually negotiated um, because of the internal, uh, I mean, just the, the sizes of these societies and states, etc. Right. So the only way to get there is to change the politics of knowledge or to offer alternatives to the, po the politics of knowledge. And this is essentially what we've tried to do um, by uh, providing case studies with an overarching framework and providing a, a or with the hope of providing an opening uh, uh, to further work and you know, invitation to people to tear this down, but build something that actually depends on, on normal procedures of study uh, by social scientists going and observing people or collecting data as the economists do who are mentioned in the book um, or historians who go read materials or do oral history, etc. Rather than presumptions about what these societies are and what these people are who, who, live, who live there. So I will stop with that.
are you? But it's more of a comment than a question. Sorry, very question, but you're speak up. Uh, hi, just speak up. Hi, I study at Bone Hall, the School of Law. And uh, what Professor Bashir just said at the end, uh, where he mentioned that there needs to be this demystification and this, that social science has this job to whereby we actually really need to go and observe and analyze what's really going on on the grounds. Uh, not so long ago, I was looking at Balochistan and law in Balochistan, specifically Jirga law, which is tribal law, and how it relates to formal law on the state level. And what was very interesting was that I went to the field with my own, you know, preconceived notions that, oh, you know, tribal law is this, and formal law is this, and they're completely different, and oh, wow, I'm going to go and say Jirga. <coughs> and it's, you know, and what you realize is when you're on the ground and you're sitting there and you're hearing these people talk and, you know, looking at the procedure, there's a lot of formal in the informal, and there's a lot of informal in the formal. And when you're sitting in, say, the Supreme Court, and this is very funny, but it's also very interesting, and not so long ago, I was sitting in the Supreme Court, and this judge says that, oh, you know, 2,000 rupees, you're saying 2,000 rupees is okay for, like, it's okay for, an, like, an ex-husband to give to an ex-wife to raise the kid. I mean, in 2,000 rupees nowadays, you can't even feed a dog. So are you saying that you're going to feed your child with 2,000 rupees? And those were his exact words in the Supreme Court of Pakistan, which is something you would expect of the Jirga. <laughs> but the Jirga, instead, when you go there, it's like far more formal, and you know there is this hierarchy, and there is this uh, there is this entire structure to it, which you wouldn't essentially you know expect. And so you know Max Weber and this entire you know notion of demystification and you know looking at things in terms in terms of relationality rather than you know as complete binaries. And looking at dualism rather as complete dichotomies is something that's very important for social science today and for legal scholars today to actually, you know, understand the nuances and, and the complexities of societies such as Pakistan, specifically places like Balochistan and the frontier provinces. I guess that was a comment. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you. Question. Thank you. Please. Um, both talks sort of touched on this, but I'm curious about the outmoded social science construct that Professor um, Bob mentioned <laughs> um, as they relate to the Afghan tribes. So what are the more valid, modernized versions of these anthropological paradigms? And then relating to uh, your, your closing argument about processes or solutions, what <coughs> would, first of all, is it the stake that you're looking for really or is it carrot? And then what would such a solution, or such a process, rather, look like in your mind? So it's a two-part question, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, I'd rather take the latter one, but, no. <laughs> but um, this, Brent, no, no. Um, no, thank you, that's a great question. You know, I'm not an anthropologist, but I think that, um, well, one issue, I guess, that a lot of this work actually is carried on as if there's no war, right? As if the anthropologists are not embedded with 50 Marines, you know? So there's a whole, I mean, it's a deeper problem in anthropology, the whole problem with the observer and how that affects, you know, that, I mean, anthropology was was born in a sense, on the one hand, serving colonialism but ignoring it in a way, you know, uh, denying its connection to colonial police authority. So in that sense, there's some continuity. But I think that much of what you get out of this stuff is, um, you know, ignores the broader context of, of the war for one. Um, and you can look at the, I mean, it's the way it's it's done. It's often done by people who actually, if you look at people who've been hired by the human tra human train system. Um, many of them actually are, are not trained in anthropology, but they're sent out in the field uh, with some kind of loose familiarity with, with the discipline. So there, there are wonderful stories of a, um, a Marachi musician who had a, I think some kind of degree in divinity from Notre Dame uh, who authored this piece that got splashed all around the internet um, about Pashtun sexuality. And this was uh, dispersed by I mean, it was it was distributed by the military to send to American troops on the ground, who were you know uncomfortable with what their Afghan National Army colleagues were doing. Um, so if you look at the, the piece, so this, the piece got to be like you know it was sent out to everyone on the ground saying this is how this is what they do, you know it's okay, but this is they have this weird sexuality. Um, and the end, the author of that was this woman from Notre Dame who didn't know any local languages, didn't know anything, had never studied the region, had a degree in Catholic theology from Mexico, New Mexico. So she's a great, you know, musician apparently, but that wasn't her thing. But that became a kind of that achieved kind of orthodoxy because it, 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 it 
it mysteriously to me acquired that authority because um, essentially her, her discipline, the methodology was anthropological. And that was enough to pass muster apparently. Um, there were some controversies. There, is a, you know, there are anthropologists who study this closely. There's a wonderful guy at, at uh, San Jose State, um, Roberto Gonzalez, who's written extensively about the human train system. I think he'd be the better source. But I think that, it, is it Mariam? Is it? Sorry, was it? Yeah. I think this is the kind of the work that, that she has done, you know, I think is a, is a wonderful alternative. I think I mean, you need, the tension is you need people trained in the discipline, but people trained in the discipline wouldn't sign up for what the Pentagon wanted them to do. So um, that's a major tension. And mostly anthropology has been racked by this, this legacy of, of guilt and of uh, you know, complicity in, in colonial projects in the past. And so people with PhDs in Berkeley are rarely going to sign up for that kind of project. So then you have a kind of you know, something operating under the sign of anthropology that is totally out of touch with what people have done for the last three or four years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, actually, and to, um, to to go further with that, uh, if you look at, uh, for example, um, the, uh, Thomas Rutledge's article on are are the Taliban tribal, right? So, I mean, so very in a very general terms, um, he says, well, first of all, not everyone belongs to a single tribe. You have multiple tribes. You have multiple factions within a whatever we call, might call the tribe. How people act is not based upon uh, any particular affiliation, but the affiliation that they want to um, activate at the point when the decision is being made, right? So the answer is, are the, the, the Taliban um, um, tribal or uh, yes, but if understood, if one understands tribe that way, then there's nothing essential about tribalism. It's actually just a, another vector in terms of how society is constructed and how social identity is constructed, right? So then it, it breaks down this any kind of a notion that we can predict or in any way, um, uh, yeah, predict basically uh, the, what people will do based upon their quote unquote tribal affiliation. So, so this is, again, I think this is the kind of work that, that Bob is talking about. In terms of what I was saying, I don't necessarily have an answer for the processes, but one of you know, for me, uh, I'm uh, originally from Pakistan. So, uh, at a, at a, that level, treating the people who live on the border region as full citizens would be a nice change for Pakistan, right? Uh, if that is to be, if that were to be implemented, uh, perhaps there would be processes that would evolve where people might feel that they have an investment in the 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 state in various ways. I mean, I'm not saying that people will somehow become more invested necessarily, but at least there has to be some opening. When, this, when the state institutions are so heavily class stratified and based upon um, a, a kind of, uh, at least to my understanding, the way Pakistan works, is the state works on, on based on the exclusion of large percentages of the population. Right? Um, so unless those things are movable in some way, uh, nothing will change. And then how to move that thing is, to my understanding, uh, better understanding, and uh, this would be my critique of someone like Ahmed Rashid as well, um, that if the frame doesn't change in which we understand people as actors, then the process hasn't started yet. Can I, uh, oh, oh, may I add one more footnote? I mean, this will sound glib because it will be so brief, but um, Gilles de Ronsoro, one of the, the French colleagues who contributed a piece, um, wrote a brilliant essay for some Washington think tank. Uh, it's been three years or so, in which he called for a unilateral American ceasefire as a kind of first step toward opening up the space for some kind of talks. And that, I think, is still, that's still worth talking about. More and more people have embraced that. The second thing for me, I mean, looking at the, the trajectory from 2001 in Afghanistan, I mean, much of the, the problem of politics in Afghanistan, I think, boils down to this constitution that came out of this mysterious bond process in December, or most of it came out of this mysterious process in December 2001. And so, um, you know, we've asked Americans to fight for this state whose structure is completely flawed, right? Um, and so in the same spirit that the Shazad alluded to here, I think the opening up the Afghan state, right, um, rethinking the nature of its president, rethinking the nature of the constitution, I think would be uh, first step toward essentially, as you say, opening up Afghan politics, uh, creating a space for some kind of contestation that is not um, not about occupation, not about you know insurgency. The gentleman with the beard. 
The question about um, types of knowledge and how you relate to this project. I'm, I'm an anthropologist myself, and actually, um, there's a number of studies that look at the use of anthropology specifically in humanitarian systems in counterinsurgency. Um, in One is John Kelly, at the University of Chicago, anthropology and counterinsurgency. The other very well known one is David Price, who's published a number of books um, most recently weaponizing anthropology, and he shows that actually there's two strands in anthropology starting uh, as early as the, even the early 19th century. Um, it's a field in, in the US tradition that starts um, with the pacification of, of, of course, Indian tribes, and these categories of tribalism and sort of um, transitioning tribal people to a more Western kind of political economic framework. Is formulated at least in the U.S. context in uh, in the, the sort of manifest destiny idea. Even Thomas Jefferson is talking about sort of what is the character of uh, indigenous U.S. people. They're tribal. They're uh, they're mobile. They must be settled, etc., etc., etc. My sense is that uh, the the people who are informing, let's say, U.S. imperial project. It's not that they're any less competent, right? So David Petraeus, PhD from Princeton, is fully aware that there are new developments in the social sciences. He's fully aware that there's this field called anthropology, which is doing a very sort of advanced work. Um, the issue is that they are selecting um, specific kinds of social science because they better conform to the structures of perception that they are perhaps unwittingly uh, sort of operating with. So if you look at, for example, um, the types of anthropology they're using, this uh, Clyde Cluckhorn's 1950s studies of culture areas, which is, uh, in Price's work, there's a, this astonishing map, actually, from a, counter uh, from a counterinsurgency manual that shows the five or six culture regions of the world, South American culture versus North American culture versus uh, uh, Middle Eastern Islamic versus is the, this Huntington kind of nonsense, right? Um, can I interrupt you? Yes. Just, can you just, there are a couple more questions and we're running out of time here. Uh, my conclusion is that I don't think um, just better knowledge is, is the mm -hmm. solution. It's uh, a commitment sort of to social justice, which I think is, or political justice, which is also implicit in, in, in your comments. So, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's thank you. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The gentleman over here and the gentleman over there. We're going to take uh, two more questions. So please make your questions succinct to the point and uh, we'll try and accommodate as many people as possible. Um, I just want to know uh, what do you think uh, the future of uh, Afghanistan is going to look like if we're having a uh, sort of Western nation state concept or the Western idea of democracy? Do you think the identities will sort of uh, get lost somewhere along like that? And tribal law may not. How, how do you, what do you think it looks like? I'm just curious. What's the future? Since you're writing the global history, yeah, no. <laughs> no, no. I mean, historians are, are horrible witches at looking into the future. But I'll put on my witch's hat. Halloween's coming. Um, I mean, war, right? I mean, I think people, I think people, misframe the issue by saying civil war will break out. I mean, Afghanistan has been in civil war since 1978. So, but the war can change and deepen, right? I think I, I don't see any alternative. I think the, the U.S. Uh, obviously its training mission is now um, floundering because of the so-called it's green on green on blue attacks, right? With the so-called insider attacks, that is now stopped. Um, so I think that was the linchpin of the escape. The other element is flooding the country with money, and you know I think that's also going to lead to to a bad end. So um, I don't know if, if Obama wins. You know, in January they'll now you know put the shoulder back to the grindstone and and send in you know a new ambassador, a new envoy. I don't know. I don't think I think they're in denial, deep denial. And I think, um, you know, the alternative utopian, you know, happy scenario would be that um, if the U.S. withdraws, the Afghans will finally, you know, left their own, uh, you know, devices. We'll have to talk to one another. But that's that's utopian. Uh, so I, my, my outlook is not optimistic. Right. Yeah, I would echo that. I think it, then it would depend on who's providing what. I mean, you know, the U.S. might, the military might recede. But all kinds of actors, uh, local as well as global, from the states of South Asia to Central Asia to Iran, 
uh, to China. I mean, it, the space will not be left alone. So it will evolve in ways depending on how these different factors come into play. But I would, uh, I wouldn't say that somehow uh, other identities will somehow disappear through. Um, they haven't disappeared anywhere right? in the United States. They haven't. So they, what they, but there is constant change. In, together with what, with what is already there. Gentlemen, here gets the last question. Yeah, one yeah. actually almost similar actually, to the question mean, which she yeah. asked. I was just wondering like, uh, how the politics of um, Afghanistan is going to emerge in the coming days since the oil has been discovered in Afghanistan. You know, there are lots of players left from China and US, the companies are trying to control the oil fields. So whether it's going to bring more stability to the, stability to the country or it's going to be more problematic in future. Oil good, oil bad. Most of the countries that have oil haven't become stable. <laughs> No, no, no. I pass. Thank you. Okay, we can take two more questions. Gentlemen here and... You touched on uh, rule of law and as far as the drones are concerned. Now my question is, a lot of people complain, especially the Pakistanis, about you know, that it's illegal and all this stuff. How is it illegal as far as for us to be conducting rule of law with, their, with the government of Pakistan completely involved at every step of the way as far as aiding and abetting? You know, with because if the government of Pakistan wanted, they can you know knock out the gr uh, drones out of the sky, but they do, they choose not to do so. So um, when my Pakistani friends say, "Hey, you know, it's illegal," I say, "No, it's not," because you know we're trying to find targets, and there are targets, unfortunately, in that area, and your government's completely saying, mm -hmm. "Hey, go ahead and take these targets out." Yeah. So how is it? You know, go ahead. I would have a slightly different understanding of what the law is than that. I mean, that's the law of the jungle. Whoever can do it, whoever can do it. <laughs> if you subscribe to that, then really, I don't think there's much to say. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, to rephrase, um, there's international law that would also govern that, sure. right? So, I mean, obviously, Pakistani national law may not be uh, complicated if, or, or compromised if Pakistani elites say so, right? The Supreme Court, you know, offers a formulation about that. But there's international law about the treatment of civilians, and that that is, I think, what's the issue. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I mean, legal experts agree is um, governments act illegally all the time, right? I mean, the I mean, it is immoral. Please let me say that. Yeah, it is yeah. immoral, of course, in every sense. Yeah, but the, I mean, but if if uh, the, the, uh, an active government in Pakistan may do that, but if the uh, legal system in Pakistan were functioning, the government could be dragged to court, as it is done all the time in the U.S., sure. as it is done already in Pakistan in certain cases as well, right? So it's not that it is any less illegal. It's, uh, I think you, so I think some differentiation between the real politique of the political choices that certain, uh, the regime is making and law, even within Pakistan would be helpful to, to see. Ali, you get the last word, make it short. Yeah, very short. Um, so basically, again, a question on um, drones. Uh, to what extent, you know, you talk about treating the citizen, uh, the people of the front of uh, the tribal areas, Fata, as full cool citizens. To what extent are drones uh, used differently in border Balochistan, where people are technically full citizens who have recourse to the Supreme Court? And is there a difference between um, how the Americans are forced to treat targets in Balochistan as opposed to Fata, as opposed to Khaybar um, proper? And also, to what extent is the fact that um, you, know, you have America uh, needing uh, to what extent are the people not allowed to be, are not brought into Pakistan as full citizens? Uh, a reason that America can treat them as targets that don't, you know, that don't get full due course of law. And to what extent does Pakistan leave them as non-citizens because America needs these people to be left as non-citizens? Yeah, I, I would have a, I think uh, my reaction would be as a somewhat more fluid understanding in terms of, um, the question of citizenship, right? So yes, the people in Fata are, um, have a different citizenship status, but what I uh, meant by the idea of citizenship, full citizenship, is actually much broader in terms of a, a sense of participation in the nation state as such. And I think in that way, uh, um, the, the people on the border of Balochistan are as disenfranchised as the ones in Fata, right? So I, I wouldn't, so that's the, more the register that, that I was going for. Um, so I, it's uh, so in some ways that kind of ameliorates the, the distinction um, that that you are making. Of course, internally for Pakistani legal processes, 
it may matter, although I, I'm not um, aware of the, the details um, at that level. In terms of American um, uh, targeting of Pakistanis, um, you know, I think that um, because of the Afghan border, it, it is seen more justifiable to do there. But of course, it happens inside Pakistan as well. The, the gentleman who shot two people in Lahore, obviously, and was freed. So that's another case of American access to the Pakistani state and to the bodies of the citizen, Pakistani citizens um, is configured on a different um, uh, kind of uh, matrix than the question of citizenship within Pakistan. Do you want to ask the last question? Oh, no, 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 thank you.